Hey guys and welcome back, my name is James and in this video we'll be restoring these two leather bags made by the Swiss Army in 1938 and 1940. These bags would originally have been used for carrying, uh, I believe, communication equipment and maps and uh, that sort of thing and all of them have been completely handmade uh, from this really rough and, and strong vegetable tanned leather and as you can see these ones are very tired and worn out and I don't think they've had much uh, much tender loving care if any over the last few decades if not half a century worth of use and they definitely do need a makeover. As you can see the leather is very tired so hopefully I'll be able to salvage this piece but I may have to replace some of the pieces. Uh, this may be the only piece that needs replacing on the bag from 1938. The 1940s bag although it sees it has some similar wear I, I don't think it's as bad. I may want to replace these pieces anyway because they are very tired. I'm going to try and keep as much of the original pieces as possible and from what I can see I should be able to and that's just how wonderful leather is as a product to work with that I should be able to salvage every single one of these pieces except of course for the ones I've just mentioned. Um, but yeah, as you can see they have some wear and tear so that's just basically a bit of mould on the top of it but that's nothing I can take of that very easily. Um, so yeah, nothing tremendously worrying about these bags, just have to take my time. One cool thing to note about these bags is that every single one of them has a very specific stamp on it telling you what year, so this would have been 4 so 1940, and the name of the person who actually made it, so H. Etter, E T T E R, and Neuerville would have been where it was built. On the one from 1938, the stamp is a bit different, and actually, this is the type of stamp that you'd find more often, so you'd have like the name on the top the place on the bottom and then the date on the or just underneath or above or just behind it or whatever. There's no point me showing you both of these bags being rebuilt at the same time since the process is going to be pretty much identical. The only difference being of course getting some stitching back into this bag specifically um, but apart from that the process would be identical for both so I'm just going to show you one, this one being the oldest. I'll use this one as an example for you guys but bear in mind that I'll be doing the same steps for the other bag. First part of this process is very, very fun, and it's basically taking them apart. And uh, yeah, on these older stitches, just to be careful that your blade doesn't slide. You want a relatively thin, sharp blade to be able to slide between the two pieces of leather, especially since these are very nice and hard pieces of leather. Um, and it's just a nice, fun little process here. You just have to take your time, but it's very rewarding because it goes quite fast, and it gives you a really good idea of how the bag was made and uh, what to expect throughout the next parts of the build. So this is one little nerdy detail here about how it was constructed. So basically it's a box stitch uh, along the sides and then a very straightforward saddle stitch for this like hinge part here. And one big question that I was having uh, in my previous restoration video, I don't know if you saw that one, was did they or, or where did they stitch, uh, how did they stitch this bottom line in uh, through the box stitch? So basically you could see that there was a small overlap here, um, so it felt like the box stitch comes in second, that's the way I see it. But the question was, was it one stitch that then went over this way? Was it the same stitch? Was it two lines of stitching? It wasn't very clear, so looking at the back, here we go. You can clearly tell there's a double stitch here going through the same hole as the one used for the box stitch. Um, now I think that this flap part or this hinge part is added on first before the box stitch is made, um, which means that for that final stitch for the box stitch just in here, so not, not the one you're seeing on camera but just behind there, so this final top stitch which would be just here, there it is. If you can see that, there we go. Uh, I'm have to, going to have to really bend this hinge part back to get to it, but that should be okay. So we'll do that, and I think that you then have uh, that top piece being attached after you've finished your box stitching, I think. 
I want to make sure that I know which one is the right hand side and which one's the left hand side because I've got two of these side panels which look very similar. Now in this specific case it's quite easy. This one has a little uh, basically rivet which I'm not entirely sure why it has a rivet there. I think there must have been some something here because I can sort of see an indentation that you can just about grab it on camera. So maybe it was to hold something, but I don't know. I don't know why there was a rivet there. Anyhow, uh, f I would normally just add a small stitch of colored thread in one of the corners just to remember which one is the right hand side. So in, in this specific case, this is the right hand side. This is the left hand side. Um, but because these are two different ones, I can easily remember that this one is going on the left. It has a rivet there. Um, so that should be the left one. There we go. Quick uh, stitch of coloured thread to them, but this is the right hand side because otherwise if you get it upside down uh, it just sometimes the holes don't line up. Don't forget this is all uh, hand stitched so all of these holes would have been made by hand and uh, yeah quite often the different uh, just different measurements and different distances between the holes means that they don't really line up if you don't get it right around. Quick little tidbit here that I absolutely love is that yes they have a pencil holder here but more importantly they've actually gone through the pain of adding a small leather stack here which is riveted into the construction uh, to give you a place where your pencil or pen can come and butt up against and uh, it's a really just a cool addition that means that uh, it's an extra step if not an extra few steps in making this but it does mean that your pencil or pen has something to rest upon, you just can slide it in, you're not going to be hitting the side of the bag. So yeah, just absolutely love that. Now in, in my case I'll be keeping uh, these specifically for the pens because I think it's a really cool little addition, but anything else I'll be removing. For example, there are these leather stacks at the bottom here which are quite big and come from about a, a centimeter and a half tall. Um, so they're not, you know, they're quite obtrusive and they would have been originally to hold whatever equipment would have been slid inside here. Again, you can see the compartment uh, that they, someone had built a compartment probably originally uh, here and uh, it's no longer here. But you've got these little leather stacks and you've got these wooden blocks and again, this would have been to hold your equipment in place. Now I have two schools of uh, two methods here. The first one which I prefer generally is to leave everything in place and leave it as original as possible. But I'm not going to do that today because I want to update these and make sure that they can be used as much as possible uh, in like today's world by adding in as I mentioned two small D-rings to be able to add a strap. So I'll be taking these off. I don't like to do that because I feel like I'm not necessarily respecting the original piece as much, but I also think that it's important to upgrade and to improve pieces that can be, especially if we want to give them a second life. So as it will be leaving holes at the bottom of uh, these, so I'll be filling in these just by using some simple rivets, uh, more for decoration than anything else as uh, they'll be blocking up the holes that will be left over. So yeah, I'll be taking these off. Uh, I apologize to any purists who don't like that move, but um, I think it's important to give this bag a proper second life, mean that you'll have full access and, and won't be annoyed by anything at the bottom. I just love how well constructed these bags were. I mean, look at this. Um, they've even gone ahead and riveted this 
belt loop, which means that despite the two stitch lines here, you've also got a rivet holding it everything into place. So this is not going to budge, and uh, it's a surprisingly good construction. I will be riving, riveting it again as it was intended. The only thing to remember is that you don't want to go ahead and stitch the whole thing first. You want to stitch here, then rivet, and then you can go ahead and stitch the rest. So yeah, again, amazing construction on these. Here are all the final pieces that I am left with, and my next step is the possibly the most annoying one, and that's trying to take out all of these little bits of thread without actually nicking the surface of the leather too much. So yeah, not too worried, but still have to be careful. Um, I'll do this off camera and just show you the end result, uh, because it's a bit tiresome and not very interesting to watch. That's one. The first bag is completely ready now for cleaning. As you can see, I've taken out all the stitches. It took me about an hour, an hour and a half, something like that. Uh, it's a very slow, painstaking process, especially if you don't want to mess up the finish or the surface of this leather. Um, so I'll go ahead and do the second bag, and obviously this will be put separately so that all the pieces stay together, and once that is done, we can go ahead and start cleaning. Looking close at the second bag from 1940, this is clearly the one with the most damage, or at least the one with the most things I need to take care of. And the first thing that really comes to, you know, just stands out is the amount of just sheer corrosion or stuff or gunk that's happening here. Now that's not an issue, it's easily cleaned with a buffing wheel on a Dremel, uh, that's no issue whatsoever. You can also see that some of that gunk is on some of the rivets, and this is a bit more annoying to clean up. Um, but not a big issue anyway. Um, this is the one rivet which I'm keeping, by the way, all the others I'll be replacing. I love seeing how these pieces turn out, and yes, they're still old, yes, they're still in some areas slightly cracked, but most of them are more or less good to go for at least another decade, if not longer, if the person who next inherits this bag is going to take care of it. 
The final step before I actually start putting everything back together is giving it a very quick, and I do mean quick, coat of Neatsfoot oil. This is a special oil that comes from the cow's leg or hoof. I'm not entirely sure which is which, um, but it's been used in saddle making and uh, bag making and leather work in general. There we go. I'm just going to put this to the side, let it soak in as much of that oil as possible. On the piece from 1939, the cracking actually looks, well, it looks worse than it really is. And I'll tell you why, uh, and it's very simple. Basically, these would have been protected with layers and layers of wax. And you can tell this by doing one simple test. If I bend it back this way, can you see the discoloration suddenly appearing on the top of that back? It's gone, and it comes back again. And that is not just the fibres opening up, because the fibres are fine. It really is those layers of wax opening up and separating and spreading out throughout the piece. So when you look closely at these, you actually see that it's it's not too bad. It's actually quite good. I'll show you. Now, I'm not entirely sure how well the camera picks this up, but although these look cracked, it's actually very, very smooth, indicating that there is actually no cracks in the upper layer of the uh, leather itself. In comparison, if you look down here, there's a small scratch there. And that little scratch suddenly helps you see the difference between where the leather is scratched and where the leather is actually quite fine, really. Now, don't forget this has been dried up in the process of cleaning it, so this will appear worse than it actually is. Uh, in the process of adding in waxes, sorry, adding in uh, oils, these little bits here will just blend in really and look much much better than they do currently. Yeah. Here, let's have a look at that that pull-up effect. Yeah, cause that's what we call it, it's a pull-up effect when the wax sort of spreads around the leather. Oh, there, that's that's a good one. That's a good example. There we go. That's a perfect example of what I'm talking about. This is what you call a pull-up effect and that's what you get when you're working with waxed, heavily waxed, or even just heavily oiled leathers. They're soaked full of the stuff, and by pushing it, you're bending it and pushing all the oils around, leaving an area in the middle which uh, appears to be much lighter. Yeah, and you can see how it disappears immediately, and if you rub it away, the oils will spread back in there, and it's gone. Isn't that nice? Now, if my theory is correct, uh, hopefully, just by adding a bit of oil, these cracks should look much less like cracks and much more like leather. Let's have a look. Yeah. Okay. Now that's what I'm talking about. That looks much better already. Now that's going to soak up the oils and hopefully look really, really nice. Off camera, I went ahead and used my Dremel to give these little buckles a new bit of life as well, as I really want to try and keep all the original hardware as much as possible. So yeah, it's looking much better. Very happy with that. I like to keep everything as original as possible on my builds, and this is why I've decided to keep these pieces. Even though they're slightly cracked, they've still got a lot of life in them, and worst case scenario, these are pieces that can be easily replaced by any cobbler worth his salt. Uh, who's willing to spend just a bit of time getting some saddle stitching back into these bad boys. The only thing I will add though is um, I want to make sure that these bags are as functional as possible and make sure that they can be used every single day by someone and that means upgrading them only very slightly. So I will be adding in two little D-rings and these will allow the future owners to be able to plug on or clasp, clip, clip on, sorry, any strap of their choice. And I'll be doing that in a very nice location, but to be able to put these in, I need to build two little strips of leather, hopefully of the same color. So let's get crafting. I have a strip of vegetable tanned leather, but it, as you can see, is not at all in the right color. And for this, I'm going to be using some Phoebe's chocolate leather dye. I do think this should be close enough to the right color. Hopefully it doesn't turn out too dark, but yeah, worst case scenario, we'll start again if it's not the right color. Anyhow, let's try this out. While that's drying out, I'm going to go ahead and cut my strips of leather at the right size.
Perfect. OK, let's move ahead. I'm going ahead and rubbing it just to make sure I'm getting rid of any of the pigments that might be clinging to the surface. This way, hopefully, we'll be avoiding any rub off on the wearer's clothes, basically. Now, look at that. I think we got pretty damn close with the colour. I'm actually really pleased with the way this turned out. And uh, yeah, let's move on. These are relatively critical pieces, uh, actually. So since they're going to be taking a lot of weight over the years, I'm going to make sure that they're reinforced with strips of cotton uh, linen, or just, just, yeah, basically just fabric on the back there. That means that even though the leather is taking the main strength of the bag, the it won't be able to stretch because it's got this backing fabric on it. So I'm going to glue that down and get back to you. There you go, guys. They're all ready to be stitched up as part of the bag. And this is more or less where they're going to be going. They'll be sitting uh, on either side of the bag on the ends here, and they'll be stitched in along with these seams. And I, I am, have to say, I'm really chuffed at how close the color got on these ones. Uh, that chocolate really did work wonders, and it's looking really quite exciting. Um, I would usually worry about the paper clips leaving a mark on the leather, but as that's exactly where the stitches will be going, I really don't care to hoots, and they'll be basically invisible anyway. So yeah, very, very chuffed with that. The little strip of, uh, of material on the inside there really is to try and help the leather not stretching over time. The leather is going to take most of the, the force of the bag, but that strip of material is going to help the leather stay put and not stretch over time. So hopefully giving the future owner years and years of great service. Okay, everything is now cleaned up and ready to be stitched back up. And uh, the nice thing about this is that it's using a traditional saddle stitch technique, which means that I can do this as it would have been done originally uh, using the existing holes and using just needles and thread. So if you want to do the same at home, you definitely can. It just takes a bit of practice using, uh, getting ready, uh, so getting used to doing a saddle stitch, saddle stitch technique. Wow, can't say that today. And for that, I'm using uh, this wonderful Maisie linen thread. It is the M60, which means it is 0.6 millimeters thick, which is thinner than what uh, would have previously been on this bag, but I find brings it back to a more modern standard and gives it more elegance using some, something slightly thinner. Um, and yeah, it is a linen thread. I will be waxing this and yeah, let's get going. Originally, there would have been something here inside the bag, um, but I don't know what, you know, some kind of divider, I guess, but I'm not too sure where that went in, uh, over the years, but uh, I'm just going to go ahead and stitch down these holes just for cosmetic reasons only. This does absolutely nothing to the integrity of the bag. It just fills in these holes in a nice looking way. So, yeah. There we go, first row of stitches is done. I've got three more, two more to go um, before actually starting the real work on this bag. There we go, all riveted up and uh, yeah, looking much better um, as it should be, maybe not, but at least, you know, it doesn't have big gaping holes where rivets once were. And as you can see, I've also done the rivets on the opposite inside because these will be clearly visible whenever you open the bag, whereas on this side, it'll be hidden by this bit. Yeah. And there you have it. A few moments later, uh, well, no, actually two hours later, I've done most of the stitching on the small intricate pieces. Um, the hardest part really has always been this buckle because of the basically stitching underneath and through the keeper here is always difficult. Um, it just takes a lot of time. So there we go. Uh, well done. And I like to end up my stitching with some beeswax, which I just rub on. It's 
yeah, it helps to seal things in and make sure that the, the threads won't slip, at least anytime soon. Um, it's not necessarily the most permanent. You could go ahead and have a dab of basically glue that you push in there, but I, I like this. I feel like this is, um, I feel like this is just nice and more natural. I don't know. I just like it. Whatever. Who cares? I care. Um, <laughs> anyhow, uh, the main stitching is done for all the little intricate bits. All I'm left of now are these uh, side pieces and of course this long attachment piece. Um, not forgetting obviously the little buckle pieces as well. Two for each bag. There we go guys, we are in the home stretch at this point. Um, I've got the, so the belt loops are sewed on. I've got this hinge mechanism sewed on as well. And I've got the sides sewed on. Let me, let me give a quick look at that. So the sides are a box stitch, which I've never done personally, but uh, I've always had fun redoing these old box stitches. So as you can see, I uh, really are in the home stretch at this point, but don't forget, we want to be attaching on these little belt loops. I've got one here. And just to show you, uh, these will go somewhere around here. I think that looks quite good. Yeah, so I have to cut them a bit to size and then punch through some holes. And uh, yeah, I think I think that will be what? Th two, three holes? I think maybe two. Anyhow, I'll see how this goes in um, and I'll try and show you as much as possible on camera. Sur le papier. <rire> tu écris maman Jeanne. Avec le poisson. Avec le poisson. Chez Jade. Ah oui. Jade le poisson. Okay, there you have it. Uh, this bag is officially done. I mean, I still want to add in a layer of wax and protection, but uh, you get the idea. It's a bit stiff at first because this is nice and you know, been oiled up again, but that's fine. Um, I've got the back all stitched up, and as you can see, I've added in these two little belt loops, which will, uh, not belt loops, sorry, just loops, D-rings really, and that means you can now go ahead and use the strap of your choice. I've got this strap, which I think is pretty plain, um, but goes quite with the style of this box and doesn't really take away from the box. That's the most important part for me. Bag, not box. So yeah, I think this little addition here hopefully brings a whole extra layer of usability to this bag. As you can see, it really doesn't take away much from the overall aesthetics of the bag um, and integrates pretty well, if I may say so. So yeah, very happy. Just let's finish off the next one and I'll show you the result. And here you have the second bag, which has also been all stitched up and I've added in these D-rings again. And uh, you can see how different these two leathers are, but however much they are different, I'm going to be doing the same thing to both of them in terms of finishing. And that's the first thing I want to do is apply some Saphir Renovateur. This is made from mink oil and waxes and it's amazing at bringing back some of that life to old leathers and adding in a really high quality shine to leathers with the waxes that are inside. I will then be using the Sephir Midae Dal just to come and give it a nice final buff and get them ready for their next life. So here we go. And this is actually probably my favorite part of them all simply because of the difference that this makes. You can already see how fast all of these waxes and oils are being pulled into the leather simply by looking at the areas where it's already actually starting to dry, um, which is a good indication. It shows that this is working. Um, so yeah, I carry on doing the whole piece and uh, I'll get back to you once it's all done. I'm 
always really impressed about how well these bags come back to life. It's a bit of work cleaning them all out and then researching them. They're definitely complicated, but they're really fun to see come back, uh, especially with this added bit of modernism with the D-rings, enabling me then to add a strap and turn what would have been hip bags or belt bags into some really cool sling bags that really do work in today's modern times. And it's nice to know that hopefully these bags will have a wonderful future with a caring family or a caring owner at least. And if you've enjoyed this video, I have another one that you are going to love, which is where I restored one of my very first bags like this. And it's again, a very old Swiss army bag that pops back to life. In the meantime, guys, thanks for joining me. Hopefully you've enjoyed and hopefully I'll see you very soon for some more leather work.